to play what? Jeez, relax. It's just... It's just Ninja Gaiden. Are you insane? That's like the hardest game ever. Yes, I know, but... But what? But it's not 1988 anymore. It's 2023. Oh, yeah, of course. Still hard. Not if we can save state between levels. Oh, uh, well, okay. I guess you got a point there. And that's why this time we're going to beat all three. Yeah, that's reasonable. What? You heard me right. We're not just playing one Ninja Gaiden game, but the entire NES trilogy. And I guess the only way we're gonna survive is through copious amounts of save states. In the late 80s, Tecmo saw many games being tossed in the bargain bin and determined they must have all been too easy. Once players beat their games, they just tossed them. And this brought Tecmo to the conclusion to make their new games so hard that they couldn't possibly be beaten as easily as the rest. Kinda overcompensated a bit, don't you think? Yeah, these are widely considered to be the toughest games on the NES right up there with Ghosts and Goblins and Zelda 2, both of which we've already reviewed and beaten. But those games are hard because of their jank controls and cryptic progression. Ninja Gaiden, on the other hand, is actually quite fair with great control and clear direction throughout. It's the relentless level design and cruel enemy placement that'll slowly wear you down to a bloody smear on the pavement. <laughs> yeah, now let's beat all three. <laughs> Why are we friends? Conceptually, Ninja Gaiden was inspired by Castlevania's level-based platformer action, so use that as a basis for gauging the gameplay style. Just add more pits, triple the amount of enemies, and triple their damage, because, you know, Castlevania wasn't hard enough, right? Let's be fair here, unlike Castlevania, all enemies barring bosses will go down in a single hit, but they'll also respawn immediately in the first two games if you move the screen back over the spawn point, making clearing a path forward nearly impossible without the right gear. In three, however, they fixed this problem, but overcompensated with outrageous enemy damage instead. But that was just with a localized version of Ninja Gaiden 3. I thought we were specifically given the dumbed-down version of NES games like Mario 2 and Final Fantasy Mystic Quest. But in this case, it was Japan who got the easier version, whereas the West got an insane difficulty spike for no reason! Make up your mind, Japan! Same thing happened in Castlevania 3, which I also beat in English against my better judgment. So anyway, also like in Castlevania, you'll slice candles or whatever the heck these floating orb ball things are, and either collect magic points called Ninpo, or acquire a sub-weapon to be activated with up and B, spending the Ninpo. These weapons will save your life, and unless you're playing 3, you can't see what you're gonna get until you cut them open. Aside from the staple boomerang, throwing stars, and flame attacks, each game has its own unique upgrade. One gets this insanely OP spin slash, dealing damage every frame you do this jump and spin attack thing that utterly wrecks the boss fights, assuming you've gathered enough ninpo along the way to even use it. And two gets this incredible body double after image thing, where without spending any ninpo, you automatically make up to two Ryu follow your movements behind you, who are impervious to attacks but can still deal damage themselves. The catch is you'll lose them upon death, but if you can manage it, they also wreck boss fights. And lastly, three um, gets a longer sword, which attack with until death. I know that sounds really underwhelming, but I promise you this is probably the best of the three, making it suddenly possible to clear areas to safely progress, defeating those trickly placed enemies and projectile tossing jerks from afar instead of up close. Granted, you probably don't want to do that in three anyway. Yeah, cause also like in Castlevania, you'll be under a time limit and it's pretty strict. But for some reason in three in particular, some later levels are so unbearably long that I swear to Jackio, they are not possible to beat without halfway timing out through the level, taking an unfair death and respawning at the last checkpoint just to continue. Though it all sounds daunting, these games have some of the best controls on the console, up there with Mario 3 and Little Samson. And when you get in the groove, you'll feel absolutely invincible like a ninja diving and slashing your way around through all sorts of goons and monsters. And instead of only wall kicking around in one, two introduces wall climbing and three allows Ryo to climb ledges and monkey bar climb. And by now you probably noticed the giant enemy health bar, and if you guessed that's another relic of Castlevania, then you'd be right. It's just the boss's health bar, there to intimidate you as you struggle to even approach them at all, as the insurmountable hazards whittle you down all the way there. So for the most part, these bosses are surprisingly manageable. Most will only take you a few tries to figure out and master, but it's the final bosses that'll really twist your testicles. Or ovaries. Or ovaries. The final boss of one is Jackio, but in three phases. The first is suspiciously simple, slashing away at a stationary orb while his puppet dude tries to stop you. 
you. The second form looks easy at first, but is insanely hard in practice. You face Jackio moving back and forth on the ceiling, shooting auto-targeting fireballs at you. And the final phase is the most insane. You challenge a massive demon hell spawn, and after severing its invincible head, you'll be able to leap into the belly and chip away at its massive health bar, dodging the shrimpy spurting acid blood from its neck until death. His, not yours, hopefully. Yeah, because if you die here, you go all the way back to the beginning of stage 6-1. And to make matters worse, your health won't be refilled between phases anymore like the first time once you make it back to them. So you're honestly better off starting the entire game over again if you have any hope of success. And it only gets worse from here. In 2, your final battle is once again against Jackio flying around the room shooting fireballs at you. Then a horrid demon that basically attacks you with random dripping poison and fireballs all around the room. And Ultimately, you'll face a resurrected demon that you'll have to defeat a lot like last time. But the catch is, even on your first attempt, your health remains the same throughout all three boss battles. And if you die, you're sent back to the beginning of 7-2. So granted, after a continue, you get to bypass any of the bosses you previously defeated, but still! And God help you on the acid drippy room if you don't have an after image power up. <laughs> and finally in 3, you fight this mecha spaceman guy who just got the TM for Thunderbolt and really wants to show it off. And then you battle an incredibly annoying demon with auto-targeting flames. And finally, Dr. Wily's giant spaceship or something. And you guessed it, no heals between bosses. And if you die, you're hurled all the way back to the beginning of stage 7. No kidding, these games have some of the most cruel punishments for final bosses I've ever seen. They're so obnoxious, I'd recommend save states between the phases if you even can, just to allow yourself a chance to practice them all. Don't get too safe state happy or anything though. That timer once locked me into a doomed boss fight where I had no choice but to take the death and start the level all over again. So I think we said it enough times. Can we all just accept that Ninja Gaiden is just Castlevania but with cyberpunk ninjas? If you replace all the generic haunty house books with pissed off dudes with machine guns, pumpkin headed hammer brothers, and freaking birds that swoop in and deal four to six damage in a single hit, then yeah, they're basically the same game. On second thought, you can't fall through the stairs. What stairs? <laughs> yeah, with all the death pits, I forgot you gotta parkour around them all instead. Real ninjas don't need no stairs! Okay, so let's just pretend it's the late 80s, and this is your best example of a cutscene. And then all of a sudden, you boot up Ninja Gaiden, and you're met with this. Man, if that doesn't blow your cartridge just right, nothing does. Ninja Gaiden is well known for being the progenitor of cutscenes in video games, turning an action game into an intense cinematic experience. And then there's this fluid sprite work, dynamic parallaxing, and multi-directional screen scrolling. Seriously, this game graphically blew everybody else out of the water. Keep in mind, the NES was very limited with color and programming limitations, and I have absolutely no clue how this game even functions, much less looks this stellar. Man, I love that one shot where Ryu finally discovers Dracula's castle. Oh, how about when he saves Maria and watches it all crumble away in the distance? Yes, we're just messing with you. You'd think an NES game wouldn't have much story. But holy crap, these games are even kookier than Kingdom Hearts! Nothing is more convoluted than Kingdom Hearts. Okay then, wise guy, just try and explain all this nonsense. <laughs> sure. So the first game begins with Ryo receiving a note from his father telling him to seek out a nondescript Walter Smith if he doesn't return from a duel. And after watching that opening cinematic, you probably know how well that duel goes for him. But then, like, Ryu gets kidnapped by the CIA's Irene Liu, who ends up helping him and sending him off to find Walter with a demon statue? Yeah, because apparently Walter's an archaeologist, and he's been studying these statues that, if combined with their other half, will resurrect the demon itself. Why did Ryu's dad just casually have this thing? So apparently the CIA have been tracking the whereabouts of these statues with the hopes of keeping the sorcerer dude known as the Jackio from summoning the demon, and instead of taking care of the problem themselves, the CIA head honcho Foster requests Ryu to stop Jackio for them. The CIA monitored this for years, and when it finally became a threat, they put it all on the back of the son of the guy who just got his ninja butt served to him by the bad guys? 
<laughs> so eventually, Ryu discovers his father being controlled by Jackio's power, who sacrifices himself to save Ryu and allow him to even battle Jackio, and of course the resurrected demon which he summons with the statues. After somehow surviving that gauntlet, Irene gets an order from Foster to kill Ryu and take the statues, as if she's gonna somehow solo this ninja dude who just murdered a literal demon, but whatever. And of course, since it's the end, she randomly gets lovey-dovey with Ryu for absolutely no reason other than the fact that they both have compatible sex organs. So next comes Ninja Gaiden 3. Uh, hold on, what about 2? Uh, no, we're not there yet. What do you mean we're not there yet? Ryu is suddenly framed for the murder of Irene and investigates the real murderer, who turns out to be a CIA-engineered clone of himself called a Bionoid. Oh, 80s. Turns out Foster had Irene disposed of with the Bionoid because she found out about his creepy mecha-human abomination factory thing he's got going on, and due to his unexplained throbbing hate boner for Ryu, Foster pins the assassination on him to get away with it. But we did what he asked, right? Why does he hate us so much? So Ryu meets up with Clancy, Foster's ex-partner, who helps him find Foster's hidden fortress, where he then meets up with Irene, who isn't really dead, because you can't die in this series if you're important enough. How on earth did she survive this fall after being sliced off the edge of a cliff with a katana? So Ryu battles and destroys the Bionoid, while Clancy backstabs the ninja, because that's just what everyone's natural reaction is anymore, by taking control of the fortress and diving through a trans-dimensional rift, killing Foster in the process. What? So apparently the CIA base was actually a super trans-dimensional warship that Clancy commands to reshape the world with mass genocide. Ryu doesn't really like the sound of that, so he decides to destroy Clancy in all his abominable forms to destroy the entire base and watch another romantic sunset with Irene. And I thought Metal Gear was confusing. So then in Ninja Gaiden 2, <laughs> what? Irene is kidnapped by an evil wizard dude named Ashtar. Why did they bother numbering the games if they don't even take place in order? So Ashtar likes all things evil, like stabbing stabbing people in the back and opening the gates to the demonic realm of chaos and leaving negative Metacritic scores for games he's never even played. Shouldn't players who beat 2 know that Irene couldn't possibly be dead at the beginning of 3, considering it's an in-between cool or something? Eventually, once Ryu defeats Ashtar, he still manages to open the realm of chaos to send his possessed sword, Ryu, and Irene into the literal pits of hell, where the thought-to-be-killed Jackio appears and takes up the sword to kill Ryu. Another sequence of brutal boss battles phases later, he's finally defeated for good, sending Ryu and Irene back to enjoy their third and final NES sunset together. I thought this was supposed to be about ninjas! You played as a ninja. That's all the game promised. So what was with all the demons and corrupt CIA guys and bio what's-its? And, and I just gave you a quick summary, too. Can you believe I actually skipped over most of the games? I believe that this was a complete waste of time, yes. Nobody played it for the story. Then why did you tell it all? Then why did you ask? Mmm. Uh, uh, Though the music is par for the course on the NES, the best parts are during the cinematic cutscenes, with dramatic themes fitting the redonkulous plot twists and story beats. I really liked it all while playing, but I probably couldn't hum a thing from it except for the death jingle. Yeah, the trauma of hearing that puppy play a million times will eventually take its toll on you. I like how in 3, Ryu goes hiya when he swings his sword. What? Save states. Have no shame in saving between levels with these ancient artifacts if it means you'll actually play and enjoy them. You can also play the trilogy ported to the Super Nintendo, aptly named the Ninja Gaiden Trilogy. Though the cutscene graphics got a nice overhaul, a good amount of things were arbitrarily removed, like some parallaxing backgrounds, music, and blood. For all the parents who thought a game about ninjas wouldn't be violent. You can even play Ninja Gaiden 1 on NSO right now, and that's including rewind and save state functionality. Seriously, don't sleep on this opportunity before Nintendo inevitably yanks it away from us. Even if the games are above your skill level, at least treat yourself to an NES-style 80s action movie by watching all the cutscenes online. Go ahead. I won't judge. The positive gamer in me rates Ninja... Uh, are we just giving them all the same numbers? Yeah, sure. Ninja Gaiden Trilogy. Cool. The Ninja Gaiden Trilogy with a hard one 9 out of 10. I'm not exaggerating in the slightest when I say that each of these games can be an absolute blast to play with modern saving capabilities. My personal favorite of the bunch being the third for its awesome game-changing improvements. The critical gamer in me sees enough value in the NES Ninja Gaiden trilogy to give them a hard and fast 7 out of 10. Each one is a huge technical success held back by their intense difficulty. Critically, I'd have to say that the original is the best of the bunch due to its generally well-rounded quality. But 
What do you think? Let us know your positive and critical sides. Rate Ninja Gaiden and its whole trilogy on the NES in the comments below. These games were specifically made difficult to keep people playing and talking about them in the late 80s. And if you don't think that the fact that we're still doing so today is a testament to their success, then you're just playing with yourself. All right, if you're still on the fence of trying Ninja Guide now, just remember that there's a modern iteration of these kind of games that is really, really amazing, and I've already reviewed them. It's, it's The Messenger. This is from The Messenger. Just watch the video, shameless plug, all that stuff. Thank you guys for watching. Remember to like and subscribe for more, and use the links in the description to nominate your own episode, which is what I'm doing right now. Right now, by the way, these are nominated episodes. This one was Zach, by the way. Thanks, Zach. Thank you to all of our Patreon members, Aspen, Aero, Sid, and Genio. Boop.